For those of us who were fortunate enough to attend the Washington World Philatelic Exhibition in Washington, D.C. in 2006. Wasn't it six? Mark, Mark, 2006. Okay. Uh, we were able to enjoy the fruits of Mark's labor because he was the main organizer of the Pitcairn Island Study Group's activities there, and uh, the activities were numerous and very, very exciting. He then became the president of the Pitkin Island Study Group from 2007 to 2011. He designed the PISG website, www.pisg.net, and has been webmaster for more than four years. He's written many articles for the PISG log, the Pitcairn log, and his wife, Mary Ann, is the production, or was the production editor of the Pitcairn Log. Did a fabulous job. It's absolutely, the, the graphics are absolutely stunning. Mark has a marvelous perspective of Pitcairn through philately and history, and he's going to share that with us in his talk, Pitcairn Island, Post Office and Community. Okay, great. Um, it's commonplace now uh, to speak uh, disparagingly of postal institutions. This is especially the case uh, in the United States, and I think also in uh, Britain. So uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, bear with me while I uh, uh, review some of the Pitcairn Island postal operations and actually say a few positive things about them. Uh, the uh, origins of the post office, of course, are uh, informal. They had uh, rather dubious uh, delivery. In the old days, uh, ship letters were, would be uh, given to uh, uh, captains or other officers of passing ships and uh, many times we're asked to be entered into the postal stream as a favor. Uh, the top cover uh, you see there is one of the earliest covers from uh, Pitcairn going to Brighton in England uh, in 1855, sent via Chile and Panama. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a good cover because it actually reached its destination. Um, this uh, practice continued uh, for quite a long time uh, we see on the bottom here an example from 1922, uh, Pitcairn to, to our old friend Gerald Bliss, uh, postmaster out in the uh, canal zone. Uh, and the, uh, the only thing that they wrote on here was uh, Pitcairn Island free. And that was, that was enough to get it through in this particular case. But as I said, uh, it was kind of a, a hit or miss operation. Um, later on, in the mid-20s, uh, the, uh, the postal operations became uh, somewhat more, uh, oh, hang on, somewhat more uh, uh, regular, but still informal. Um, uh, Bliss provided uh, a, 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 a scheme to enter Pitcairn letters into the international mail stream if the letters had got up to the canal. Uh, he would uh, make sure that they got forwarded on to the proper uh, authorities. Uh, he even went so far as to provide uh, hand stamps to uh, explain the situation. You see here the, uh, the famous uh, posted at Pitcairn Island, no stamps available, uh, cachets, uh, which are uh, quite, uh, quite valuable now. This top cover uh, uh, was sent about 1923 out to Boston to a Mrs. Mrs. Washburn. She paid postage due. And the bottom cover, uh, out to London, another postage due uh, cover. Now, uh, Bliss's scheme was in operation for uh, a couple of years until the, uh, uh, basically, the British were embarrassed into providing a more official 
uh, solution. Uh, the idea that an American postmaster would be stepping in and doing the work that the British should have been doing was now viewed as uh, a, an embarrassment that uh, really shouldn't be uh, allowed to continue. Uh, so a scheme was set up uh, with the New Zealanders. Uh, a New Zealand agency uh, uh, was set up on the island. Uh, it was an operation from 1927 to 1940. This was a, 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 a practice where the New Zealand Post Office would provide service to a few remote islands in the Pacific. And in 1927, Pitcairn Island became one of those islands. Now the great thing is that now Pitcairners could prepay letters. They had stamps. And this was a practice that had been adopted throughout most of the rest of the world in the 1860s. And now in 1927, that practice is coming to Pitcairn. Uh, another great thing was that they could now send registered letters, which means that they could send money to people. They could order things. Uh, we have here a, uh, a cover going to, a registered letter to going to Montgomery Ward in Chicago, uh, a competitor of Sears. Uh, a, uh, I guess the modern day equivalent would be sort of a, a Walmart, although maybe slightly higher end if my memory of Montgomery Ward is, is, is accurate. So uh, the Sears catalogs and Montgomery catalogs that the Islanders would have had for a long time, you know, and, and looked at all the stuff and say, look, look at all this great stuff, but we can't order anything. Well, now they could. And now they had reasonable expectation that the material that they ordered would be delivered. Of course, uh, uh, nobody was totally happy with the situation. Um, the uh, British weren't happy because New Zealand stamps were being used on the island. It made it look like uh, the islands had been transferred to New Zealand control when, in fact, they were still British islands. The New Zealanders didn't like it at all because they didn't like the accounting that was being done by the islanders. Uh, maybe it was an education issue that could very well be that, you know, they didn't quite go out and maybe set everything up quite correctly and explain everything. Um, and the pit carriers also had problems. I mean, definitely it was an improvement because it was a, uh, uh, you know, a formal operation. It was, uh, there, were, there were regular uh, 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 activities going on. But they were also running out of stamps occasionally and sometimes more than occasionally. And here we see uh, uh, one of these examples. Uh, this, is, um, this is kind of a, a, a postal tape, gummed postal tape in this, I think would have been put on uh, a parcel coming from the island. They, they used the agency hand stamp here to give it, make it look somewhat official. And then they had this typewritten endorsement, no stamps available at Pitcairn Post Office for 60 days collect postage in USA. So maybe it got through and maybe it didn't. In 1937, um, a British civil servant went out and uh, uh, was doing uh, various studies and uh, he came to Pitcairn and uh, uh, one of his recommendations was that uh, a Pitcairn Island post office be established and that stamps, Pitcairn stamps be printed. And Fortunately, those recommendations were adopted. And in uh, 1940, the post office is established, October 15, 1940. Um, some other British civil servants, Mr. Maud and Mr. Fuller, uh, set up the processes and procedures for the post office. Uh, they arranged for stamps to be designed and produced. Uh, Mr. Fuller went out to the island. I'm not sure if Maud make it, made it, but Fuller did and uh, set things up and got things going. And the most critical thing, I think, was that they did a really good job on the stamps, uh, the first eight stamps. Now, here we have the hay penny. We have the hay penny issue. And this is a specimen. This, the word specimen is uh, perforated into the stamp. And we have the origins here with the king, of course. Uh, the one penny has, they decided to embrace the mutiny. 
Uh, and this is five years after the Mutiny on the Bounty movie, which of course was a big hit around the world. So Fletcher Christian is on here with the king and Pitcairn. <laughs> on the one and a half, uh, we have the uh, famous portrait of uh, John Adams, another mutineer, and the, uh, the famous uh, uh, picture of his house. But uh, on the two penny, we have the bounty and we have uh, Captain Bly. Uh, uh, we, ha we, cannot, uh, uh, we have to have some link to the uh, authority figure here. We are British after all. Uh, so Bly is, is, is put on there, and obviously not a popular stamp among the islanders. <laughs> and uh, I think they chose this rate, two penny, because it didn't actually pay anything. Uh, it didn't pay any particular rate, so it wouldn't have been used very much on the island. It was available, not used very much. There's also the three penny, which is an educational stamp showing you where Pitcairn is. That's a good idea. And the six penny, this is a real beauty. Uh, the uh, bounty in full sail with the king, a great stamp. And then on the one shilling, uh, the king and Fletcher Christian with, uh, I guess, an imaginary portrait of, 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 uh, of Fletcher. Uh, again, uh, a nice multicolor stamp, uh, one, of, one of my personal favorites. And finally, the high value, uh, which was a two and six, which um, was good because uh, it wasn't 10 shillings. It wasn't a pound. It meant that if you were a collector, you could buy this whole set for not a lot of money. And again, uh, Fletcher uh, makes his reappearance on the, on the high value along with an, with an island scene there. Uh, okay, now we've produced the stamps, we've got to sell this stuff. So um, the authorities in Fiji and also on island uh, produced booklets that, of, that would have the whole set of stamps sold them for four and eight, and those were sold to people on passing ships and things like that. Uh, the way more successful way was to uh, uh, have the crown agent sell the, forward the stamps onto, um, onto stamp companies, stamp dealers. Here we have an approval sheet from the Gotham Stamp and Coin Company of Springfield, Massachusetts, and this would have been about 19... Uh, 52, 53, something like that, and you could get it for 90 cents. So that's the way most of these stamps were sold. And of course, there was a benefit to the islanders. Now we had, we had enough stamps. And we have a, here we have a non-philatelic first day cover uh, going from Stella Young to uh, a son in New Zealand, sent on the first day. It must have been a a happy occasion to have this, this new service uh, uh, available right then and there. Uh, so now the post office becomes a profit center. Uh, the money is rolling in. Uh, in 1946, the first stamps were issued in 1940, 1946, uh, the peace issue comes out, and that's a two penny stamp and a three penny stamp. So they're pulling in more money. Uh, but then in 1948, they decide to really go for it. Um, they decide to issue uh, stamps to commemorate the Royal Silver Wedding, and that's, that's a normal occasion where you would issue stamps, and all the colonies did. And they issued a 10-shilling stamp for Pitcairn. So the previous high value was two and six, and you know most of the stamps that were sold were like one, uh, one penny, two penny. Now they've issued a 10 shilling stamp. Uh, on the right here, we have a letter from then uh, postmaster Roy Clark. And most of the letter is a usual Roy letter. A lot of complaining about his health, a lot of complaints. Uh, but in the middle here, he does write a paragraph about this stamp. He says, uh, why in the world they should issue a 10 shilling stamp for Pitcairn, I fail to see. Sounds ridiculous. It seems that the government is pandering to stamp collectors. The stamp business to me is all a fraud anyway, a money-making business from start to finish. So, so don't hold back, Roy. Tell us how you feel. 
And he does. Uh, I don't know if this is, I would use the word fraud, uh, but I will say that I've been collecting Pitcairn uh, uh, stamps for a long time, and I've never seen a non-philatelic usage of it. So maybe he was right. But it's a nice stamp anyway. It's, it's, it's a great portrait, double portrait there. Um, so anyway, um, uh, it, the prophets, you know, they're rolling in. Uh, Mr. Neal, who helped uh, recommend going down this path, came back to the island in 1951, did, did another study. The treasury now has 45,000 pounds in it. Now, before the post office, there was less than 100. You know, a little over 10 years later, there's 45,000 pounds. The annual budget is over 5,000 pounds a year. Uh, so one of the first things, you know, they're doing infrastructure projects. Here's the school, constructed in uh, 49. And this was a school that, you know, if a British person saw it or an American person saw it, would say, oh, that's a school. They would recognize it as a school. Uh, so all these great things are happening. The only problem is that 93% uh, of government revenue is now coming from stamp sales. So there's not a lot of uh, diversification of revenue sources, uh, which maybe they didn't care about diversification, but stamp collectors are a, a fickle lot, and I certainly wouldn't count on them. I never have. So, but anyway, for now, they have a lot of money. Uh, the post office has also served, obviously, as a communications facilitator. Uh, and now we can get more regular communications with the diaspora. Here we have this really uh, cute letter. It's going from, it's in the hand of Floyd McCoy, and it's going to Ben Christian on Norfolk. I don't know if it's, if it's Irma's Ben Christian or some other Ben Christian, but it's a Ben Christian. And he's on Norfolk. And it's an airmail letter that gets uh, it was posted in 1953. So now there's regular exchanges now. This can happen. So 100 years, almost 100 years, after the island is evacuated to Norfolk, and then a few years later, a few of them come back, now there can be some real communication that doesn't cost very much and is, gets through. So uh, a great thing there. Uh, post office is communications facility continuing. Advertising. Advertising hits Pitcairn. Uh, you know, civilizations rise and fall, but advertising lives on. Here we have uh, uh, a, what, what is called a Dear Doctor card. And these were sent for, by drug companies to doctors advertising their wares. This particular one was going to France. Message is in French. Posted at Pitcairn. Uh, here we have something, uh, uh, a card from the World Exchange Club Cosmos of Sweden, whatever that was, and going out to some guy uh, in California. So again, Pitcairn is helping to advertise stuff. Oh, there we go. Um, also, newsletters. Obviously, the miscellany is the most uh, famous one, uh, and uh, you would get these sent out to you from the uh, from the island uh, back then. Anyway, this example is uh, kind of uh, interesting because it's going to our old friend Wilf Bloom when he was uh, resident in Cape Town, and of course, Wilf being Wilf, he had to have it sent airmail registered. I, why, I don't know. Why, why, why a newsletter had to be sent registered, I don't know. But mostly they were sent uh, at a printed matter rate. And that would have been two cents or four cents, depending on when it had been sent. And so, that, so these newsletters could be sent out all over the world for very little money. And again, so you're marketing the island. You're educating people around the world about the island. It also, uh, Pitcairn also served as a relay point. Uh, Neil made, made a note of this in his uh, study. Um, here's an example of a uh, letter sent by a merchant sailor who was sailing uh, through the canal down to New Zealand. And he's a guy named Julian Simons. He was on the James Roy Wells, and the James Roy Wells was part of the American Foreign Steamship Company. 
and he, I, he's probably writing his brother or his father uh, back on 94th Street in Manhattan, and that's a rather Tony address now, I must say, but uh, I don't know what it was back in 1947. Anyway, so what would happen is uh, the ship, was, in this case, the ship's coming down from the canal, going towards New Zealand. They stop at Pitcairn. He posts his letter, and then a few days later, another ship came along, and they put the letter back on, and it went back up to the canal, and then finally on to New York. And so one of the most remote islands in the world is now an effective postal relay point. Who knew? Who knew? And here's another one, and this one was going to, from a ship passenger uh, to, uh, to back to England. Eventually, though, um, uh, this practice becomes uh, obsolete uh, because of the uh, uh, delivery of the Boeing 707 to Qantas in Australia back in 1959. Um, they, uh, uh, so instead of having to take a passenger ship, if you're going from New Zealand to England or Canada or wherever, you could now cross over to Australia and in 36 hours be anywhere in the world rather than spending six weeks on a ship. So that kind of killed that off. Again, uh, there was also a telegram service. Uh, they were facilitating commerce. You could transfer money now. Uh, here's a British postal order uh, that's, excuse me, that's uh, in particular for Pitcairn Island. You could order things. There was a parcel post service. Uh, the Pitcairn Souvenir Agency sent out this brochure, and you could order all sorts of stuff from Pitcairn. You could order a box for your Bible, a Panama hat, all these other th souvenirs, and you could get that shipped out to you. And here's a customs declaration. This particular uh, shipment was a basket, uh, six kilos worth of baskets. And here's a parcel bill, and I'm running out of time. But here, uh, here's a more recent item. This is from 2006. This uh, was a banana shipment to Marsha Fox in New York. And, and we, we, we have a problem here because the postage on it is $45 to send a load of bananas uh, to, to Marsha. So you see that the business model is now starting to break down a bit. $45 bananas, $45 bananas. I mean, they might be great bananas, but it's still $45. So, so basically what we see here is, is the rates for parcels that have been just going skyrocketing. Uh, just as an example here, five kilos back in 1971, 65 cents, any country in the world. To, to, the, to Europe via the UPS, USPS, $50 now. So a hundredfold increase, and that obviously is causing problems. The post office has also uh, 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 reinforced the link to the crown. Uh, you see the queen's portrait or the queen's, uh, the royal cipher on all stamps. There have been 500 stamps, so this has been reinforced 500 times. Uh, this may have been relevant during the recent trials when some folks tried to say, ah, oh, Pitcairn really isn't a British island. And uh, the Privy Council, maybe some of them were stamp collectors and were familiar with these stamps, said, ha, 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 no, you're, you're a British island and British law applies. And the post office is also linking Pitcairn, kind of establishing it as a country in the international world, especially with the UPU. So they are, they've been a full member of the UPU since I think about 39 or 1940. Here is a folder, souvenir folder, that would have been given to delegates at the UPU conference by the Pitcairn delegate. And finally, the, uh, the, uh, the post office says family glue, I call it, uh, jail mail, some of us call it. Uh, uh, there had been no real reason to have in, an internal letter service on Pitcairn uh, until uh, recently. They, they had always specified rates, you know, but nobody ever used them. Well, now the rates started to come in, you know, actually have practical meaning. And uh, so here we see a letter from Randy uh, to Nadine uh, back in 2007. It uh, doesn't contain the letter. I can imagine what the letter says, and probably you can too. 
but uh, 10 cents, 8 cents US would, would send your letter from the jail to uh, the destination. So the conclusions here, uh, over the past 70 years, the, uh, the, the post office has uh, funded a modernization uh, and, and ex infrastructure expansion, marketing, publicizing the island, binding the diaspora more closely to the home island, uh, facilitating an export business, uh, helping to continue on island family relationships, binding the country to the British crown and by extension to Britain and by further extension, the European community. And helping to establish the idea of Pitcairn as a country, although not an independent country, obviously. How it's going to be in the future? Well, they'll still be, fund, uh, be a, a funding source, although at a lower level. Although you can help by buying something from the Philatelic Bureau, who's out here during the break. Uh, also, facilitating, facilitating the export of merchandise, but again, something probably needs to happen to fix the, uh, the, the huge charges that are being faced. Uh, marketing or serving tourists, and maybe possibly in the future, uh, supporting uh, seabed mining and seabed miners, because that's, a, that's the whole, that's the big new area now. And Pitcairn, because it's four islands that are very, rather dispersed, covers probably four or 500,000 square miles of ocean floor. What's down there? I don't know, but it could be good. So we could have miners coming to Pitcairn. Whether that's a good thing, whether Pitcairners want miners there, I don't know, but they could arrive someday. And that's it. Thank you.